Welcome back to Turtles All the Way Down. One of the greatest puzzles that I've been struggling with and I think about incessantly is the one about consciousness and how it works. It brings me wonderful joy but also maddening frustration. I'm not the only one. Philosophers and scientists for millennia have questioned what consciousness is and how it comes about. The nature of this profoundest mystery is the subject of this video. First of all, what do we mean by consciousness? Well, throughout the centuries and even today, the definition has varied and depending on who you ask, the description can change. What I'm going to land upon is closer to what American philosopher Thomas Nagel meant in his famous 1974 paper, What Is It Like to Be a Bat? His concept of what it's like expresses consciousness as the subjective experiences we feel. It is the internalized impressions we experience that makes up consciousness. The blueness of the sky when looking at it, the redness of a flower, the feeling of pain when burned or pinched, the excitement we feel within when a sense of accomplishment washes over us, or the overwhelming depression we experience during times of sadness. Each of these internally felt experiences are called qualia, this is what we mean by consciousness. They are the internal impressions that we feel. Throughout our history, the nature of consciousness had been greatly debated. For centuries, the idea of a divinely inspired non-physical mind and personality called a soul incorporated within humans was what differentiated us from the rest of nature. The soul was what was assumed to be what our thoughts and persons were composed of and were temporarily inserted into our more earthly bodily vessels. But it wasn't until the 17th century that consciousness was given a more thorough philosophical analysis. The French philosopher and scientist René Descartes was the foremost of thinkers, but others such as the English philosopher John Locke and the German polymath Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz lent very important contributions to our understanding of the nature of consciousness. René Descartes' Latin cogito ergo sum, or I think, therefore I am, summed up his first principle of philosophy. This was the only thing we can know for sure, and without any doubt, said Descartes, that since we think, we exist. All other facts and pieces of knowledge about our world must be derived from that point. So consciousness, in a sense, was the absolute linchpin in the entire philosophies and science of Descartes. He believed that consciousness was composed of a kind of non-physical substance called mind. This was separate from the physical brain, but they both somehow interacted with one another. The seat of consciousness in the brain, Descartes reasoned, was in the pineal gland. Descartes' concept of consciousness was that of a dualistic nature, mind and brain. So he pioneered one of the two main philosophical camps on consciousness called the dualist position. The other philosophical branch is called physicalism. This states that consciousness is completely derived from brain itself and nothing else. There is no other substance that is needed to explain consciousness, says the physicalists. Most philosophers and scientists of consciousness subscribe to this stance, so I will focus the rest of this discussion on physicalist theories. If the physicalist or brain theory of consciousness is true, then what is it that breathes life into the brain to create the internal experiences we feel? The core of the science of microscopic neuroscience of the brain consists of networks of cells called neurons. Each one of these brain cells is very eccentric and different from the rest of the cells in the body. From their cell bodies extend a single long fiber called an axon. 
In addition, the cell body also branches out thousands of smaller arms called dendrites. Axons and dendrites all connect to thousands of other neurons, making up multiple connections in the brain called neural networks. Electrical signals flow throughout these networks when thoughts or sensations are made and transmitted. The brain is constantly firing these networks up and sending them along to other connected networks. The brain is essentially a vast volume of interconnected networks all communicating with one another. It is amazingly complicated, but it is also within this chaotic storm of energy that consciousness emerges. Our main question is this, how do these electrical signals that fire across neural networks possibly convert into an experience? When we experience the feeling of sharp pain, how can that be derived from an electrical signal? What we are trying to find are what are termed the neural correlates of consciousness and how these translate to internal experience. In other words, how do the neural correlates of consciousness create qualia? How can a neural network signal convert itself into the feeling of greenness, say. When we examine a thinking brain and a live functional MRI scan of the brain that shows signaling in real time, nowhere do we ever see something green show on the computer monitor, nor do we see or experience the sensation of a pain when viewing these scans. Only the subject feels and senses them. But how? How does the functioning of the brain convert to experience? How does this conversion work? This is what the philosopher David Chalmers called the hard problem of consciousness. This is in contrast to his easy problem of consciousness, which relates only to describing the functioning of the brain during consciousness. There was a famous thought experiment devised by Australian philosopher Frank Jackson in 1982. It goes like this. Mary is a neuroscientist who has lived her entire life within a black and white world. She isn't colorblind, but she has never experienced colors, just black, white, and shades in between due to her environment. She has studied the human brain and its functioning to the utmost of knowledge. After she learns all there is to know about the brain, she is then given a color television to watch. Is there now something new that Mary has learned? She now sees and experiences what it is like to feel redness, for example. If there was something missing from her previous physicalist knowledge of the brain, and she now learns something new when viewing colors, can't physicalism be false? In other words, Jackson is maintaining that consciousness consists of something more than just the physical workings of the brain. There is something beyond the firings of those neural networks that leads to our experience of consciousness. Research has recently been expanding in the field of consciousness study. Monitoring the brain during altered states of consciousness such as during sleep, comas, brain diseases, general anesthesia, psychedelics, and vegetative states have been eliciting vast new data for science. Many theories or models for consciousness have been proposed. The most prominent one is called Integrated Information Theory, or IIT for short, developed by Giulio Tononi in 2004. It is a model that attempts to explain consciousness mathematically using the Greek letter phi to calculate it. Phi is used to determine the quantity of integrated information in a system. IIT takes three requirements in order to work. One, information. There are many types of information in the universe. Some are symbolic, such as letters and words, to mathematical symbols while others are physical or chemical, such as electrical switching and pulses to genetic combinations. 
In the IIT model, the important information are those between neurons and networks of them. Two, integration. The second requirement in IIT is that of integration. Information must be integrated or connected in certain ways. This is realized in the brain with neural networks and connections between multiple networks. Three, maximality. The third requirement is that all of that integrated information must be maximally so. That is, the greater the number of interconnections, the more the consciousness. You may ask then, does IIT imply that other things in nature are also conscious? Answer, yes. The consciousness of integrated systems in nature vary widely, but do not necessarily need to be human brains. Consciousness can exist in other animals, other living things, and even, yes, in systems that we would normally deem non-living. Another prominent model for consciousness is called the Global Workspace Theory, or GWT. Proposed in 1988 by neuroscientist Bernard Bars, it expresses how competing unconscious signals are made conscious. Typically, there are multiple sounds, sights, feelings, sensations, and thoughts arriving within our brain at any given moment. Most of these, however, are unconscious. GWT posits that it is only when the combination of the loudest or strongest ones merge in working memory that they become conscious. It is like a theater stage that has a spotlight on it. This is the global workspace in GWT. The actors within the spotlight are the conscious thoughts while those outside of the light are still acting and moving but are not highlighted and therefore consists of our unconscious functions. We are not aware of them. Other consciousness theories include physicist and mathematician Roger Penrose and psychologist Stuart Hameroff's Orchestrated Objective Reduction orc or model or Michael Graziano's attention schema model, and many other less prominent ideas. Perhaps one of the strangest is that of panpsychism. David Chalmers and the British philosopher Philip Goff, among others, have championed this idea. Panpsychism is the hypothesis that consciousness is an intrinsic property of all matter and energy. Just as a proton has one unit of positive electrical charge, it also has a certain quantity of consciousness. Yes, a proton. An electron inherently has the fundamental property of a half unit of quantum spin, just as it has a certain fundamental and minuscule quantity of consciousness. This is just an inherent and fundamental property of all particles in the universe, so says panpsychism. It is just that consciousness becomes apparent and observable only when enough of it is combined. Under this theory, everything in the universe has a certain amount of consciousness. We humans just happen to possess the most concentrated amount of it. With all of what has been said about consciousness, one remaining question may arise. Can consciousness ever be simulated or artificially produced? Do not confuse this idea with artificial intelligence, or AI. AI is an artificial system that operates in an intelligent manner and may act creatively, but does not imply any form of self-awareness or inner experience. A system with AI may not feel anything at all. It is like a zombie without any feelings of redness or pain or genuine emotions. Many scientists, engineers, and philosophers believe that yes, it is possible to recreate consciousness in an artificial system. Most of those that follow the panpsychist or integrated information theory believe so. The reasoning is simply because since brains can do so, 
And since brains function at the level of constituent informational units, neurons, there is nothing else needed. Neurons and networks can be simulated in a computer or other framework. If consciousness is simply the sum total of these parts working together, then replicas of those parts can be simulated in other frameworks as well. Consciousness, in other words, is substrate independent. It does not matter what form of matter the system is made of, and it can artificially be made to form consciousness. In summary, consciousness is one of those big ideas that screams out for an explanation, but is difficult to define. It is traditionally interpreted as what it is like to be something our inner subjective experiential self. Philosophy and science had first attempted to locate it as a gossamer non-physical substance, a soul, and have moved into defining it as a property that is inherent in a particle, as an integrated system of information, and as a spotlight on computing signals and networks. It is still a beautiful mystery that we possess and can enjoy for ourselves. Until next time, keep asking these big questions and never stop wondering about the world we happen to find ourselves in. Please subscribe and like Turtles All the Way Down. Bye for now.